Hey guys, so today I'm going to be going over the number one book I think you should buy as a beginner learning C++. Now there's probably a myriad of reasons why you want to learn C++. Most likely you're coming from another programming language, but if you're also a beginner, this book recommendation also will suit you. Okay, so without further ado, what is this book? So the book is, and hopefully you can see it properly, C++, A Beginner's Guide, Second Edition, by Herbert Schild. Now, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name right, but I'm definitely pronouncing his first name right, Herbert. All right, that is the book. Now, you're probably asking, why is this a good book for me as a beginner? Maybe you come from another programming language like Python. Maybe you just want to strengthen your fundamentals, or maybe you know nothing at all. Well, there's three reasons why I think you should pick up this book. The first is it has a mastery check at the end of each chapter. There's around 12 to 14 chapters, depending if you consider the appendix a chapter in itself. Um, but of these 12 to 14 chapters, there is a mastery check at the end of each chapter, which is nine to 10 fundamental questions about what you learned in this chapter. Everything from conceptual questions all the way to actual coding problems. The second reason I really like this book is because of the amount of passage checks it has scattered throughout the chapter. The worst thing that can possibly happen is if you read a whole chapter, you get to the end, you get to the mastery check, and then you realize that you didn't understand a word this chapter mentioned. And that passage check allows you to periodically check whether you understand what you just read. All right. Now, the third thing I really like about this book is the uh, very distilled examples that it provides. It doesn't get into the weeds too much. It gets into the just the right amount of detail you need uh, as an individual learning C++ to understand what the uh, section is trying to communicate to you. It doesn't go off and give you detailed section A, paragraph B, uh, appendix C type breakdown of which exact rule this particular example applies to. It gives you a very distilled and finite example such that you can understand what this book is communicating. All right, so no clickbait, that's the book. That's what I recommend you guys to read. Hey guys, one last quick thing before I end this video. I don't usually jump, do jump cuts. I like speaking fluently throughout the entire video, but I've actually forgotten something. And that is the underlying question of how do I know if this book is right for me? Not for me personally, but for you. So how do you know if this book is right for you? Well, I'm going to actually propose three questions, three programming quiz-related questions. And if you can get all three right, then maybe this book's a bit too basic for you. And if you maybe get one, if you at least get one of the three wrong, then I think this book is definitely worth having to read a couple of chapters, if not to read the whole thing. So let's get started. I'm going to propose three questions. I'm going to wait a little second. In that moment, you should pause the video, think of the answer, write it down, reason through it. Hopefully you're not cheating because you're only cheating yourself. And after that, I'm going to tell you what the answer is and why. Okay, so on your screen, you'll see the first question. The first question goes like this. You have a global variable, int j equals one. You also have a main function, right? And in that main function, you have i as a reference to j, and you also initialize another variable j. In the next line, you set j equals two, then you print out i and j. What will i and j be printed out to? Pause the video now. All right, hopefully you've thought it over. The answer that gets printed out is actually one and two. Now, why is one and two printed out? Well, there's really two concepts here. First is scope, and the second is really global variables. Um, and the two kind of go together, really. So uh, I'll speak about both of them, but they kind of mesh together here. The reason being is because, one, you need to realize that you can declare two variables with the same name in different scopes. So that gets you over kind of the compilation phase. You know that this thing will compile. You know that what I'm showing you on the screen is legal. The second thing you have to understand is, while walking through the initialization of i as a reference to j, the j in the main scope has not been initialized yet. The only j that's available to be looked up is the j in the global scope. So I will be set as a reference to j in that enclosing scope, the scope above the main function. Then j gets initialized, and, and j isn't initialized with anything. It's not default initialized, it's not zero, it's just junk. It has nothing in it. All right, so you have at that first line an i that represents to, an i that's pointing or is a reference to the global j, and you have j that's initialized with junk. 
Well, in the next line, you set j equals 2. So the j equals 2 isn't now referring to the j in the global scope, it's actually referring to the j in that local scope in the main function. So that j that previously had junk in it now has 2. So when you go to print it out, you're actually printing 1 and then 2. That's the answer to this, 1 and then 2. All right, so if you've gotten that one wrong, then you already know that you should probably pick up this book. Let's go on to the second question. Um, the second question goes like this. Let's say you have two functions, both called f, and they are overloads of the f function. So one takes in a character pointer, and the other takes in an integer pointer. Now, if you print, uh, if, you, if the uh, one with the character pointer is selected, then one will be printed. If the one with the integer pointer is selected, then two will be printed. In the main function, you have a one-liner, f, zero. So you, function f, taking in zero. What will be printed? All right, so the answer for this is that the program actually doesn't compile. The reason being is that the call to f is ambiguous. Now, if you read this book, you know that, you'd be able to recognize that. Not only does it talk about function overloading, ambiguity, but it also discusses um, uh, null pointer convention. So the null key, so null, uh, null pointer, and zero are both taken to be null pointers. And you would have known that once again if you read this book. Now the last question before we depart, and before you know, or maybe you already know whether you need this book, um, is this. Let's say you have a class C. You have two structs before that, struct A and struct B. When struct A is instantiated, you have A printed out. When struct B is instantiated, you have B printed out. Now, C is very simple. It has two member variables, B and A. B is first, then A. And in the constructor, you have A being initialized first, then B. What will be printed when C is initialized? I'll give you a second to think about it. All right. So the answer is that B will be printed out and then A. The reason being is because the order that things are initialized is not the order that they are in the initialization list, but the order that they are declared as member variables. All right, those are the three questions. Hopefully you've learned something. If you've learned something, that means you'll learn a lot more from this book. If you haven't learned anything, well, maybe this book isn't for you. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave a like and a comment. Uh, if you enjoyed it, I'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts. If you've read this book and it's become useful to you, please share that in the comment section below as well, and I will catch you guys later.